it's just that if you're really just working long hours, you're probably getting tired and you're going to create inefficient processes. And um, I'm going to probably get this wrong, but I think it was someone like Steve Jobs who said he likes to hire a lazy person because they'll always find the most efficient way to get things done. <laughs> Welcome to this episode of the Ask Valor Masterminds podcast, brought to you by A Advanced Services and Fuse Networks. My name is Galen. I'm Joe. We're coming at you virtually from the Creative Block Studios in Seattle, Washington. So, Joe, for our new listeners and viewers, how did our podcast come to be? Sure. So, it first started out as a private Facebook group page, and the purpose was to bring business owners together to kind of just uh, share tips, ask questions, and do some mentoring with one another. Uh, and because we're a, a marketing company, we get asked a lot of questions outside of marketing as it pertains to businesses. So we thought, what a better way than to bring on guest speakers to talk about different topics related to business. So selfishly, we can help our clients out, but more importantly, we can help uh, entrepreneurs out uh, you know, on the internet. Right. And then since it's the beauty of the internet, we get to connect with business owners, entrepreneurs all over the world. And today, all the way from Sydney, Australia, Mr. Lloyd Thompson gets to join us. Uh, welcome, Thank you so Lloyd. Much for having me. Thank you. All right. Great to be here. All right. So today's topic is how to teach your team to think on their own. But before we get to that, let's uh, formally introduce our guest. Yep. So Lloyd Thompson, having dedicated over 20 years to the corporate world, navigating through various technical and leadership roles, found himself desiring a change. Lloyd wondered how his adept skills in people management, projects, operations, and process improvement could be utilized in a different, perhaps more dynamic environment. He discovered an opportunity to provide my director of operations um, services on a fractional basis to smaller non-corporates that are more nimble and interesting. Today, Lloyd and his team continue to serve a pack and mix of online, businesses, online business owners and teams of 10 to 30 staff, mostly marketing agencies and e-commerce, but also coaching, education, real estate, to a variety of other businesses. What is interesting is that even though the business offerings are different, the challenges they need help with are often very similar. The owner is overwhelmed, or overwhelmed with run activities instead of focusing on implementing their vision and working on strategy. There are people challenges. Are the right people in the right seats? Why do I have them? Why do I give them all the solutions? How do I resolve this conflict? projects and operations could be running smoother. For Lloyd, it has been a delight moving to support online businesses. Things move much quicker. He is able to help them with simple and effective solutions, which have been distilled from the very best frameworks that worked in corporate land without the red tape. Lloyd has since published nine ways to leave your day-to-day -day operations to help business owners know where their blind spots might be and how a director of operations can help them if they want to delegate these ways to someone else. Everyone, welcome, Lloyd. Thanks for having. Thanks for joining us. <clears throat> thanks so much. Wow, it's a, it's a super long intro. I hope everyone's still here. <laughs> uh, yeah, everyone's still here. The time difference. We didn't lose anyone, so we're all right. So let's get into it. We ask our guests the same three questions. So, uh, Joe, do you want to start? Sure. So, what are some early lessons learned as an entrepreneur? Yeah, for me, with my business, um, because my background was in corporate world, I was originally hiring for me and my team. And when I started now hiring director of operations for clients, I realized things were a little bit different. So my business got to a certain size where in the beginning it was me. I was the one-man band. I was the director of operations. I was the person serving two or three clients at a time. And when I got to my fourth client, I realized I couldn't do this all myself, so I went and hired another director of operations. And I was hiring someone who aligned with my values. Unfortunately, when I put them into the client's business, it just they just didn't resonate. They were, this is the style that I like, sort of high empathy, high EQ. The client I was with, they were used to me, and I can be quite to the point and very direct. Um, and I like to think I've got those soft skills too, but putting in someone who was very different was a bit of a surprise for them. And so I was not able to extract myself from the business. And so what I've learned is I now have to not only consider who I'm hiring for myself, but I also have to look at the client's values and the client's style. 
And it's a little bit like dating. Like some people are going to match and they're going to mm-hmm. really, you know, form it along. So I have to get a, a feeling of what the style is of the, of the client I'm working with, what their culture is. And firstly, make sure we're a match. Like what's the culture of virtual do and what's their, what's their culture like? But also if I'm going to put someone, one of my team into their business, yeah, I need to make sure that they resonate. So that, that was a bit costly in the beginning, but, um, but I've worked that out now. All right. So in all the years that you've been in business, uh, what is the best piece of advice that you've been given? So I think not only just in business, but also in life, community and mentorship is just so important. Um, I, I was able to start my business off a conversation with a business coach who's a friend of mine. And I wanted out of corporate world. Um, I just wanted to do something different. I wanted to work remotely and flexibly. And I, I spoke to my business coach friend and I talked about what my skills were and um, what my goals were. And he was able to put me on the, the right path. And he is still my business coach today. And so, so many mistakes have been avoided through having an, a proper mentor and a coach. I mean, don't get me wrong, being an entrepreneur, you're going to have, you either get success or a lesson, and there's been plenty of lessons along the way. But just having a mentor is just going to get you there so much faster. And also community. I mean, being an entrepreneur can be a bit of a lonely sport. It's, it can be very rewarding, but then some, you've got to make the decisions. Uh, how are you going to drive your business? Where you want to go? The strategy is yours. And um, so having a, having a community of other business owners where you can bounce your ideas off, talk about challenges you've been through is super important. And I've also found that in traveling as well. Um, I was very fortunate in 2008 to drive a car from London to Mongolia as a charity, of, uh, a charity wow. event. Yeah, I mean, don't get me started on this. I could fill up a whole podcast. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um, you, there was challenges every day. You know, where am I going to sleep tonight? Where am I going to get fuel and food? And so to do this thing, like to go from London to Mongolia, you have to pass through very barren places, places where, you know, they're not going to speak your language and you're going to rely a lot on community. And if you seek help and ask, ask the people, they'll help you out. You just need to be open to it. And uh, so community and mentorship, those, that is the advice, that is the focus, and that's what I've learned. Awesome. So because we are a marketing company, we always ask our guests this, this question, why is marketing important? So... You might have the greatest business in the world or the greatest products or greatest offering. You might be the best delivery person there is. But if no one knows you exist, you're going to have zero business. And, and that's, I find a lot of people have amazing ideas. Hey, Lloyd, you know, it's, it's great seeing you've started a business and, you know, maybe we can go in something like this. I have this great idea. But without being able to test out your offer and without being able to get people to hear about it, you've you've got no business so it's so important it's the front door it it deserves a huge amount of focus so yeah no marketing no business awesome so now we come to the part of our podcast our a advanced services pump you up quote of the day so i asked lloyd for a quote and take you back to roman times from marcus aurelius i'll read this quote and lloyd get your thought waste no time arguing about what a good man should be B1. Lloyd, (laughs) share some insight, please. Uh, Marcus Aurelius was the most powerful man in the world. And yet he was a very ethical person. And he wrote this book called, um, he he wrote his notes, which he left by his bed. It wasn't for anyone. It was called The Meditations. And he would write his kind of conclusions of the day. And they weren't, yeah, they weren't meant for anybody else. And when he died, they discovered them. And it was just all one-liner badass quotes like that. (laughs) <laughs> and and it's just that is him like if you ever just look up marcus aurelius quotes you're like wow this guy what a legend and so he's basically saying yeah don't talk about what it is to be a good person just show us the way just lead by lead by example is the modern way of that quote and um so i i'm you know if you could be a fan of someone for two thousand years ago that i'm i'm a huge fan of marcus aurelius awesome thanks for that now we come to our Did You Know segment, sponsored by Fuse Networks. 
Cyber criminals deploy millions of phishing schemes daily, and that number is only on the rise. Can your employees spot more modern, sophisticated phishing schemes? Strengthen your frontline of defense by implementing cybersecurity awareness training and help reduce the risk of a data breach occurring. Call Fuse Networks, your local Seattle IT experts at 206-701-6040 and get ahead of the curve. So we have two trends and two myths. Um, we'll read them and then Lloyd, give us a thought. Joe, you want to start with this first trend, please? Sure. Remote work and flexibility. The COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated shift towards remote work and flexible working arrangements, a trend that is likely to continue. So I think with more and more people working remotely, it's just showing that there's no place for line of sight management anymore. Like old school management where you're just focusing on what time someone clocks in and clocks out is just not going to work. And it's, it never really was an effective way of managing people anyway. Um, I think the best way to manage is to focus on the outcomes. It's great to get reports from people and status reports. Yeah, how's it going? Mm -hmm. But line of sight management's just not going to work. So if you're running an online business, knowing how to manage people remotely is really important. And with most businesses now, particularly in corporate land as well, becoming more remote, then it's time to upskill. Awesome. So this next trend, data-driven decision-making. Leveraging data analytics to make informed decisions is becoming increasingly crucial in today's business environment. So uh, talk, share some insight on that, data-driven decision-making. Yeah, stuff's moving faster these days, like the market responds so much quicker. And if mm -hmm. you're not looking at the data that runs your business, you're flying blind. And this doesn't have to be super complicated. It surprises me how many businesses aren't looking regularly, and I mean weekly, let's say, at their sales numbers, their marketing numbers, their operational incidents, their financials. Because when things change, you need to respond quickly. Um, so that is really it. Like, Make sure you're measuring the things that matter. If you want to improve at something, start by measuring it. You know, I went, I went on a holiday recently. I put on 5 kgs. I now, I'm now trying to lose that. It starts by measuring it and working out what the inputs are and uh, how the output's going to change. Awesome. Because it's, it's just a quick thought on that. Because yeah. it's almost similar to like the news cycle. You know, like it used to be a 24 hour news cycle, then Twitter, now X has changed it to a 24 second news cycle. Everything's yeah. instantaneous. And your data points now, you almost have to listen to and be almost accept a more proactive instead of a reactive kind of approach, right? For You've got to be making fast. decisions. Yeah. Everything. So. All right. Uh, this myth, Joe, yep. share this myth, please. More hours equals more productivity. It's a common myth that working longer hours equals higher productivity. In reality, long hours can lead to burnout and decreased productivity. Yeah, a absolutely <laughs> true. I mean, um, it's not only that. It's just that if you're really just working long hours, you're probably getting tired and you're going to create inefficient processes. And um, I'm going to probably get this wrong, but I think it was someone like Steve Jobs who said he likes to hire a lazy person because they'll always find the most efficient way to get things done. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, this last myth before we uh, get into the topic, how to teach your team to think on their own, I'll read. The best leaders have all the answers. Great leaders don't always have all the answers. Instead, they are open to new ideas, willing to learn and capable of making informed decisions. They also empower others to make decisions and develop them as leaders. So share some knowledge with that, please. I think this is about growth mindset and actually with the topic that we're gonna talk about today, thinking that your leader is gonna have all the best ideas is just not gonna be true. You're gonna get, if you set people up with the goals of what you're trying to achieve, quite often you're gonna be able to find better, better outcomes. Mm -hmm. And um, a leader who thinks they know it all is just, it's just a bad way to go. You know, Growth mindset's the way to keep on improving, keep on pioneering. Um, yeah, the best leaders don't have all the answers. They're constantly learning and evolving and adapting, just like what we talked about with that mm -hmm. data-driven decision-making. So for today's topic, how to, how to teach your team to think on their own. For a lot of our viewers out there 
who are maybe watching this or consuming this podcast and they have a team that doesn't think on their own, do you see one or two common things that business owners do wrong when they think they're empowering their team when they're really not? Um, what do you, what have you seen with the clients that you've worked with? So I get this thing where business owners are coming to me and they're saying, um, you know, I'm, I'm making all the decisions in this business or they come to me all the time with all the questions and I'm constantly making them. I'm driving the decisions and I'm, and I'm deciding everything. And the question that comes up a lot, oh, isn't this, isn't this common sense? You know, why are they asking me this? And um, I think the, the founder is just, as a result of this, gets stuck. They can't let go of the reins. And as a result, the, their business really is them. They don't have a sellable business. And when I look deeper, quite often, I think the problem is actually the way the business owner is handling things. And um, I get that, get into that more in a, a moment. But what they really need to do is switch to coaching. So in short, this is when someone comes to you with a problem or a question, instead of doing that, what appears to be an easy thing at the time, switching that back to them and just say, hey, look, let's just work through this together. Like, you know, you're, you're giving them a, an outcome that you want to solve. In your mind, you would have had a solution to a problem or you would have thought through some kind of things to debate what the answer might be. Mm -hmm. So that is a great place where you can flip those questions back to that team member and say, let's work through this through together. You're trying to get them, you're trying to give them an outcome that you want them to solve. Like you want them to be an artist, if you like. You want them mm -hmm. to choose their own adventure to get there. And the more you go through this process of questioning them to come up with a solution, the more you can start relying on them. But it is a lot of work. I'm not going to take that away. Like to go through this coaching process with a team member takes time. And if you are going to do this, then it means that um, your team members need to be okay knowing that it's going to be safe to fail because sometimes you're going to give them decisions and they're going to make a mistake. And so if you if you give them a decision to make and then they stuff up, so you're going to start small, right? right? If you give them a decision to make and something goes wrong and then you, you really, you know, make a big thing out of it and punish them and, um, you know, there's severe consequences for it, then they're just going to lock up. They're not going to come to you with ideas and initiatives anymore. So it's a double-edged sword. You want them to come with initiatives and new ideas, but at the same time, you need to make it a safe space. And it's funny that we talked about, um, you know, my connection to the Philippines, uh, your background. Actually, in, in corporate world, I had um, a very large team in the Philippines. And when I first started working with this team, what I found culturally over there is unlike Australia, where it's kind of the norm to challenge your boss, over there, it was very much uh, an agreeable culture, a service culture. And so I, when I was soundboarding ideas off my team early days, I would find that they were just very agreeable, but not really challenging me or coming up with different ideas. And I thought, how can I possibly break this? Because these people I had in my team, very smart, uh, technical people uh, creating banking products. Yeah. And um, so it was really just a thing about not wanting to challenge me. So what I did is I said, look, I'm going to throw out some tests here occasionally. I'm going to just say something ridiculous. And I'm just going to see if you're... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the sometimes is, it wasn't... The a world test. is flat. Oh, okay. I got you. Yeah. You know, yeah. things like that, right? <laughs> so. Well, the, the thing is, sometimes my ideas were actually crazy, right? You know, it wasn't a test. This is not a drill, you know? And so... Yeah, yes. That's when you really get the value. It's like the team are like, is this a test? <laughs> so... That, that was a culture change for them. And I had that team for probably five years and just letting them know it was a safe place, letting them know I really did want them to, to challenge me, changed things a lot and allowed me to hand over the reins a lot more to that team. And what I've found is it doesn't just work with individuals as well. So you don't just have to coach people one-on-one. -on -one. You can do this 
in a team sense as well, and there's a framework for that. And the framework's an old old one, but a good one. And it goes by the initials, um, the uh, uh, GROW. So GROW stands for Goal, Reality, Options, Wrap Up. So what's this about? So let's say there's a problem that needs to be solved and it's gonna take a group of people. And so in my past life in particular, these would be a tech department, Mm -hmm. server meltdown, something like that. We need to get the band together. We need to get a group together. We need to solve this problem. So your team members, find the people who are gonna solve this problem. Mm -hmm. Now, in the virtual world, this can be a virtual meeting room. Or it could be, you know, if you've got a business that's bricks and mortar in a physical place, so get everyone together and state the goal. So in this case, it might be, hey, look, the goal here is the server map melted down, it rebooted, that caused a huge amount of time offline. We need to be able to figure out why this happened and prevent it ever happening again. So I would come in with the goal. Now, the reality is where I'm going to draw up, might be a virtual screen, what I think the current state is, like this is the server, this is what I think happened, but I, you're not quite sure. Now, the, the best bit about this is it doesn't need to be too detailed because what you're looking for, and especially if you're dealing with a technical audience, by the way, is you're looking for someone to interject and say, oh, that's wrong, or you know, they, they can't stand things, techies being wrong in particular. But you want to be able to get the team members involved. So when you're drawing up and describing the, com- the, the current state, the reality of things, you want to get them involved and as soon as you get them involved to start drawing out and describing what the current problem is, that's when you then flick to that questioning model, that coaching side, and you want to give them the pen or you want to give them the screen that you're sharing with and start asking questions. So then you're, you're no longer the person that's driving the solution. You're there then talking to the team and going, oh, okay, so... Is that what it looks like? And, and what do you think? What do you think the options might be? And working around the team. And so that's where you can group facilitate to find out the options. And the other beauty of this is by having the team come up with the solutions, you're also likely to get a lot of people buying into what they're coming up with rather than you know the boss, the founder, the owner coming up with a solution. Some people might think, oh, well, that wasn't really the best option. They might not feel comfortable challenging me. So this is a great way to get to get buy-in from the team, to get them involved. And so then that's it. They come up with the options and then finally they they wrap up. You know, you wrap up the session and say, okay, the team agreed with option one, this is what we're gonna go with. So that's kind of the basis of what I would call the conscious coaching, you know, the most known yeah. method of coaching. But I will so say for this. A quick, a quick oh, question please. then. Yep. So when essentially you want um, the workers to almost feel like stakeholders and collaborators, for a business that has never done this before, um, is there like a simple exercise? Like you don't want to start with like the most major problem because you want to create this culture of, all right, we're going to start doing things this way. Is there an exercise to start off like something so simple as, this is our model for this marketing campaign or uh, help hmm. me come up with a description for our new service. What, what's low hanging fruit to at least get initial buy-in from your team to start to establish this? Because I'm saying this from an aspect of a company that has maybe said, do it the boss's way, right? Here's a yeah. playbook. You're going to read off the script. This is how I want you to answer the calls. This is how it's been, been, been done for the past 12 years. And for the next 12 years, we're not going to deviate. But when a business owner is open to this idea, you can't just flick the switch and mm-hmm. say, we're going to do this. What, yeah. what is a good start you know, for this G-R-O-W kind of process and everything? Yeah, I think you've got to start small. I completely agree with that. And you know, you're going to start with small problems. It might start with revisiting your company values because quite often I work with businesses and they talk about they've got company values. Um, But when I go there, they might either have something that's under the covers that's been there for a very long time and no one actually knows what they are, or that they might have had a workshop 10 years ago, listed out 10, which is too many, like three to five is great, and no one knows what they are. And if you test the founder and what they are, they've got no idea either. So the values are a great place to start because if you're starting, if you're going to revisit your values, 
One of them might be something that's initiative related. So I mentioned earlier that I like to think of my team like artists. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. In my business, I've got a value. We are artists. And right. what that's about is saying, I'm going to give you an outcome that I'd like solved or we've got the business, the clients we're working for, with. These are the objectives they want solved. Uh, choose your own adventure, but I'm here to support you. It's yours. You own it. It's very initiative focused. And I've seen other businesses use something similar, like we're pioneers, just really initiative focused or um, batteries included. So looking at the values is a great place to start with that. And later on, that comes into play, actually, because this is a spoiler alert. I, the next thing I was actually going to mention is what I call subconscious coaching, again, related. Yeah. And that is that is when you're trying to align people with a value. So when someone does something aligned with a value, for example, you know, they've taken the initiative, this is a great place to call out on your Slack channel or whatever to say, hey, I just want to draw your attention to uh, Jane has just come up with this great idea and led this initiative. Just call it out as a great example and link it to your value. At the same point, if there is... Uh, a value that's not being adhered to and you're seeing that in your team whatever it is whether it's initiative related related to what we're talking about today that's where you want to pull that person aside privately and say hey look this is not where we're trying to take our business this is not an example of where we want to go and that's a private thing so celebrating the culture you want to bring is hugely powerful and i think that was a, an old time um lesson from the one minute manager which is a classic legendary book yeah. um so on the topic of values values is a really good place to start great question but you really need to make sure that you as the founder and as we talked about that quote earlier about marcus aurelius you've got to lead by example so if you've got 10 values that's probably too much you're not going to remember them anyway and i'm picking on that because i work with a business where he had 10 values and one of them was let me see it was something like humans first organization and yet they were doing screen recording of all of their team members like all day they were using screen recording software and i questioned them on it i said is this really necessary because it doesn't seem like it's a humans first organization if you're screen recording you can still get the same outputs if you're asking people to you know tell you what they've done how it, how it's been uh, achieved you don't need to record their screen. People are going to do their banking during the day and things like that. So the point here is revisiting your values, leading by example, and using them as a place for coaching is exceptionally powerful. Awesome. awesome. Um, so for people that want to get a hold of you, uh, what's the best way to contact you if they had other... <clears throat> questions they wanted to ask you from our audience and everything what's the best way to contact you yeah um just look up my website it's virtualdoo.com um, i'm also giving away my book at the moment you can find my book nine ways to leave the day-to-day -day operations on amazon um, but i'm also giving it away if you go to virtualdoo.com slash book and for those that are joining on video it's a nice picture of it it's a primer of what a director of operations uh, actually does to make your business run smoothly so well, um, since we're in the U.S., will, that, will we have to pay for shipping? Even though the book's free, how's does that work? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you'll have to pay. It's not too All expensive. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, most of our audience is based here. That's why I'm asking if, if you know, yeah. we would try to probably try to get your book and everything. So, oh, there's a there's a PDF. It's a PDF download you can get from my site. So if you like reading oh, you on go. PDF, go for it. Yeah, awesome. Actually, I think our third most downloaded country is Australia. Is it? Wow. Yeah. yeah. We're not all out in the snakes in the bushes like we do actually do some reading. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so do you ever make it, do you, have you, do you make your way over here uh, to the U.S. At yeah. All? Uh, I was actually there last month. I was in Orlando for about seven or eight days uh -huh. and um, mainly, mainly a holiday. Um, yeah. But I try to get out to the U.S. every year. So the year before, I went to San Diego to um, a marketing conference. 
And uh, yeah, it's great, great to get out, great to visit clients. So because most of my clients are actually in the US and Canada. Okay. Um, yeah, it's just, just the way my business has panned out. There's more online businesses in the US and Canada. Um, I seem to have done quite well in getting the word around and that's just where the people are. I've got a, a client so, in the UK as well, so get a few early morning phone calls. So for our audience listening, um, getting your word out, get, becoming more popular, uh, is there a certain um, type of business you like working with better that seems to be a better fit? I generally find marketing agencies and e-commerce businesses are the sweet spot for us. And we've, okay. as we, we've worked with a pick and mix and others, but I generally find those type of businesses, they are, the, the, the owner is very much a high visionary character. And the things that they're really wanting to focus on are oh, the, the, the product and the strategy and the relationships. For those high visionary, high creative folks, getting into putting in like the, the rhythms and the repetitive things and the feedback loops and the daily measures, that kills their soul. They generally don't want yep. to do that. They're, they're really focused on the next thing. So it's generally more about the owner than the business, but I've just found that those types of owner tend to exist most in e-commerce and marketing type of businesses. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. So on behalf of our sponsors, A Advanced Services and Fuse Networks, my name's Galen. I'm Joe. Coming at you from the Creative Block Studios in Seattle, Washington. On behalf of Lloyd, all the way from Sydney, Australia, thanks for jumping on, being our guest. It was great. And uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in, watching this episode of the Ask Valor Masterminds podcast. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Lloyd. Thank you.